Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK into your homes, into your hearts, into your space. Welcome to my channel. If it's the first time you're passing through, well, you're welcome. And um, please like, share, subscribe, interact with my subscribers. And yeah, I wanted to do the, a weekly roundup because I haven't done a daily roundup for a couple of days because I've kind of been concentrating on individual topics. So I thought I would do a weekly roundup. It's not going to be the whole week because that would just take too long. So I've just kind of selected a few key areas which I wanted to cover with you. And the first one has is, has the coronavirus made you resentful and spiteful? Now, um, I noticed in the sun yesterday, it was talking about the over 50s. They should be on a rollout. They shouldn't be allowed out, basically. They should be on this phased return, um, well, phased rollout. And they shouldn't be allowed on the street. And the police should fine anybody over 50. And if they catch them on the street, and they should be more or less um, sent back home. Now, to me, that is... I can understand the logic. Apparently, people over a certain age, they are more prone to get the virus. But I just think it's a bit about, oh, I want to think about me. This is about me. You know what I mean? To me, it's it's got nothing to do with bringing the whole country together. It's about divide and rule. Well, maybe not divide and rule, but it's more about how can I benefit out of the situation? I'm not worrying about the elderly. It doesn't really matter that they might want to get out even more so than the young people. To be honest, there's not really, um, there shouldn't really be a preference because whether you're old or you're young, everybody wants to get out and do something. And I think even if they did it like um, the buses, maybe give them, if they did want to go down that route, instead of saying, oh, they're not allowed out at all, let all the young people come out, let them, you know, let the elderly of the over 50s that they're calling bloody old, let them, you know, let them come out, say, between 10 and 12 then, if you've got a problem. And if you're, if you're worried about them, because the same way they've been going to the shops and using self um social distancing is the same way technically they should be able to go out and the thing is what they don't realize it's it's the elderly who are who are keeping up the economy they have more fluid cash than any young person who's going to just go out there and buy bloody mcdonald's or whatever it is they're going to buy i mean you know i think they have to be really careful not to discriminate and I understand the logic behind it. But to me, I think it's a bit of, you know, um, what did I call it? Um, I just said, I think I just said snitching, to be honest. I said 50 year olds should stay at home and let the younger folks get on with their lives. This is what the son said. But this is also after they, um, Boris Johnson talked about retirees returning back to work. And they're the ones that are supposed to be holding up the NHS. They're the ones in the firing line of the coronavirus. They're on the front line. So it's OK for them to come out, go, at, go and work on um, people with the coronavirus in hospitals. But they're not good enough to go out and integrate on the street. Does that sound fair to you? It doesn't sound fair to me. So I said, um, to work on the front line, oh, it's called a rolling age release strategy. That's what they're calling it. They've even got a name for it. And the police must stop and ask for ID. If they don't have ID, they're supposed to be fined. It all becomes, it's all about me. That's what happens in the end. And that's what happens when people are pushed in a hole. It's about me. They stop caring about everybody else. There is a point when they do start caring and start being empathetic. But pushed in a corner, it's all about me. I don't care about you. I don't care about my neighbour. I just care about me. 
So then people start snitching on other people. Apparently, um, they're reporting to newspapers about people working on building sites. And they had, I don't know who it was, on Good Morning Britain, having to justify why certain people are on building sites. And they're, you know, they are, you know, monitoring themselves and they are watching the social distance regulations. They are complying. But you've got the people in there, they're thinking, oh, well, I can't work. Why should he be able to work? Or why should she be able to work? Instead of thinking, aren't they lucky they're being able to work? No, they have to find a way to stop them working because they can't work. And that's when the resentment, the bitterness all comes in. And that's when things start going downhill. We don't need that mindset. We can work at this together. You know, you don't need to say, oh, you know, the elderly can um, can stay at home so the young people can get out. The fact of the matter is, I think that this whole thing has been blown out of proportion. I'm not saying it isn't, it isn't, um, it's not, there's nothing going on. But I think that the media have exaggerated big time. And the sad thing is, is that trying to make it go back to normal is going to be so much more difficult now that the media has exaggerated. I mean, they want to bring back football. But what are the footballers saying? The Premier League players are saying they don't want to go and be in contact with any other players. They don't want to take anything home to their family, to their children, to their wives. So they're resisting returning to football. So you see what's happened. They've blown this thing way out of proportion. I'm not the proportion. I'm not saying there isn't, we don't have a situation, a serious situation. We do. But it's got to the point where people are so scared and paranoid. They're afraid of going back to normal. And that's very sad. Now they're talking about how can we get people back on the planes? You know, because people are worried about going to the airport and with travelling, you can't practice social distancing. Because it's not that kind of, it's not that kind of thing, is it? I mean, you're getting on a plane, you're going to the airport. But what they are saying is that what they will do is take temperatures of people and they will also um, make sure that people, the only people that are allowed to fly are low risk. Now, does that mean the elderly will not be allowed to fly and ethnic minorities will not be allowed to fly because they're high risk? That's what it seems like. So that is where we seem to be at the moment. I don't know. I think the only way that they can reduce the fear that the government has created is by talking about the recoveries. That is the only way. Because at the moment, everybody's paranoid about the coronavirus and thinking they're going to die from it because they're not hearing about the recoveries. So if they want to reduce the fear and get this country back on its, you know, on its feet, they're going to need to be honest and open about the recoveries that they've been holding back on all this time. What else have I got here? Okay, let's talk about furloughing, the furlough breakers. Now, we all know the background is is that um, employers can reclaim wages, up to 80% of wages, for for employees that stay at home. Um... And they can also top it up to 100%. And I'm not quite sure how they choose who they want to furlough and who they want to keep full time. But that is what they are allowed to do. But the condition on claiming furlough, the grant for furloughing staff, is that they do not work. No work at all for that employer. So um, what some employers are doing, they're calling up staff and saying, look, we want you to come in. Now, they are allowed to do that. They can tell their, their furloughed staff to come back to work.
but there needs to be a minimum of three weeks off, three consecutive weeks off, uh, you know, on their furloughed status. After the three weeks, then the employer can ask them to come back. But if they come back, if, they, if the employer ask the furloughed staff to come back before three weeks, or if that furloughed staff does any work, even sends an email, even makes a you know a project plan for what they're going to do when they get back, they have broken the furlough agreement and they cannot claim for that staff member. So, and I'm not quite sure how the government will know that they've sent an email unless somebody snitches or that they've done any work. But that is the rules and regulations of that game, of that scheme. They cannot work. Now, if they have sent an email or they have broken the furlough agreement, then technically it's up to the employer now to pay that staff member the salary. Now, because the staff member has agreed to 80% under the furlough, does the employ does the employer then have the right under the furlough scheme that he's broken to pay them at 80%? Because suppose they want to keep that staff member as a furloughed staff member, but they still want to utilise that staff member in the workplace. Is it okay for the employer to pay that staff member at 80% because that staff member is technically not working? except for a few little bits and pieces. There's no employment law to cover that. So I guess it, up, it all depends on the arrangement or the agreement between the employer and the employee. What do they agree to? I think an employee, as long as they're not coming up short, I don't think they'll mind staying at home at 80% and then going in and doing the odd thing there now and then or responding to an email. But who knows? They might say, look, I don't want to do anything for you. That is the condition of the agreement that we don't work at all. But then you're going to be thinking to yourself, when all this kind of clears up, am I still going to have a job? Or can the employer say, look, you know, we're going through rough times and you're going to be the first one because you were uncooperative. I'm not going to say you're uncooperative, they're not going to word it like that, but you you know, you are going to want to think about the security of your job. So, staff selected for furlough can be rotated, must be furloughed for a minimum of three consecutive weeks, and cannot do any work for the employer. When they say you can be rotated, they can actually have different members of staff that they've had on full time and those on furlough and they can switch them all around. You don't just to have to, you don't have to have a furloughed staff that's furloughed through the whole three months. They can switch them. Okay, so as long as employees were on the company books before the 19th of March, they can be furloughed on condition that they do not undertake any work for, for the business. Otherwise employers cannot claim the grant. However, it does not prevent employees, employers from calling workers back to work at any time. Um, the employer will still need to pay the employee. The question will be, I've already said that. Self-employed contractors engaged by an employer can continue to carry on working as they're not covered by the scheme. Okay, we've got some news, dropped a piece of paper there. We've got some news on Senegal. Senegal, they've um, got this $1 testing, diagnostic testing kit that tests um, effectively their population to see whether or not they've got the coronavirus or not. $1 it cost them. It was originally made for the dengue fever and they've adapted it um, for the coronavirus. And they reckon they don't need no high-flying lab. It's a simple test that can be done anywhere. They intend to make over 2 million kits for all African countries. So they won't need to rely on um, first world um, in intervention. The kits will allow them to detect and isolate patients quickly. So can you imagine, you know, 
where where is the um the UK are saying well if you want a ventilator you can we can send you one over for sixteen thousand pounds. They can get it for sixty I mean sixteen sixty thousand dollars if they're getting it from America. They can get it for sixty dollars themselves. So why are they gonna be getting these um ventilators for sixteen thousand when they can get it for sixty dollars? So once again the anti malarial drug um which is chloroquine that the US and UK are denouncing saying, oh, it's not effective, you know, it's not really doing the job. This is what's curing the, vi- the, the um, curing coronavirus in Senegal. And apparently they've only had two deaths. And I think it's a 90% recovery. Well, I don't know if it's the rest of them that recovered. But anyway, they've only had two deaths. Total. And massive recovery rate. And malaria is endemic in sub-Saharan Africa. They've only, they only have 50 ventilators at the moment for 16 million people. Senegalese engineers are producing their own at $60 per piece as opposed to 16000 for the imported model. A month into the outbreak, Senegal has suffered only two deaths with most patients treated healed. So... Um, I'm not quite sure whether they've still got some critical and they haven't died yet or what, because they're saying most patients healed, as opposed to saying um, suffered by two deaths and the rest of them are healed, if you see what I mean. So uh, Senegal apparently has the largest rate of recovery of patients infected with the coronavirus in Africa, the third in the world ahead of countries like USA and France. But how can that be? How can it be when they have such a tiny health budget? How do they manage to save and lives and, you know, enable people to recover when you've got big countries with a big health budget like America, USA and France and people are dropping like flies? They're, they're not recovering. They're all that we're being told doesn't make sense. I mean, they kind of denounce Africa and say, oh, it's behind the times. They don't have this. They don't have modern equipment. What's the point of having modern equipment and being guided by science if you're not saving lives, if, there's, if you haven't got a similar recovery number or a, civil, or a similar level of containment? You've got, you know, similar reduction of deaths. What is the point of having all this sophisticated equipment, spending all this money, when back in back in beyond in in Senegal, they're doing it on a, a limited budget. And that's what happens when you put brains before profit. Senegal has got the brains, but the Western countries are too busy making profit. Apparently, Senegal has a wealth of experience when dealing with infectious diseases and outbreaks. The same country that perks, that flags. Oh, yeah, I was going to say this same country, you know, they we could have benefited, you know, lessons learned. How did they do it? You know, what are they doing that's so successful? But oh, no, you see most of Africans. They, they, they um, raise the red flag from the Home Office. They can't come here. So even if you wanted to, um, for them to come and discuss stuff, remember all those Africans that were meant to come for that big, big event? And they, were, they couldn't come in because the um, Home Office algorithms flagged Africans as not being secure enough to come into the country. They might want to stay over. They might want to overstay. So they couldn't come in. But we can learn from them. But do they want to? That is the question. They might not want to learn from a bunch of Africans. They're more likely saying, oh, no, we're, we're the superior ones. What can they teach us? Well, they can teach you, number one, how to contain the virus. And number two, how to be economical. And number three, how to reduce deaths. Isn't that what you want? 
And last but not least, the NHS migrants are not automatically extended. I mean, I don't know how many people are under the impression from the news that the NHS migrants who are working, you know, I was going to say we're working for the NHS, but the migrants who are working for the NHS, they're not automatically extended. Apparently, um, they need to have an individual letter according to immigration law. They can't just make a blanket ruling and say, OK, all the NHS um, staff, migrants, can be extended till the 31st of May. They're not allowed to do that. So even though Priti Patel is saying she can use her discretion, every single person who is going to be extended needs a letter. So now the Home Office has to go to the NHS and ask them for these letters. We're the 1st of May now. How long is it going to take them to get it? What's the point of extending it? You've only got a couple of weeks left, three weeks, three or four weeks. But that is apparently what needs to be done. So the Immigration Act deems a written notice to be given to each and every individual affected. I wonder how much resources the Home Office is going to need to do that and whether they can turn it around in time. There is a little bit of good news regarding tenants. You know, we we hear so much on the news about the homelessness and people can't afford to pay their rent and stuff like that. Well, only 2% increase in late rent payments over the last month. 2%. That is absolutely brilliant. That means the majority of people have been able to pay their rent. Okay, most tenants have kept up rent payments. Um, claims from landlords was below 1% for their rented properties. Payment plans from estate agents is less than 10% of the tenants. And the 40% of landlord estate agents have noted that landlords on their books have been particularly supportive during the crisis. So that's a bit of good news. And, you know, I was listening to the news this morning. Pray, pray, pray. It looks as though... Things are going to ease off a little bit. Regardless, I don't know how they're going to do it. I just I just want it done. Don't you? Don't you? So we'll have to watch this space, peeps, and I'll keep you posted. That's all for now. Bye-bye.